On May 31, 1988, the agent of the secret communist police, Mr. Zvonko Hraster, arrested a young publicist and dissident, Mr. Janis Jansha. A military court sentenced Mr. Jansha and three of his colleagues to 18 months in prison just a few months later. Judgment stated that he misused his intellectual skills because of his criticism of the communist regime. In August 2010, the state prosecutor, Branka Zobitz Hrastar, filed indictment motion against the leader of opposition and president of the Slovenian Democratic Party, Mr. Janis Jansha. In the indictment, she accused him that in the year of 2005, at an undetermined date, at an undetermined place, and through an undetermined method of communication, he received an unknown promise of reward to intervene in the transaction between the government of the Republic of Slovenia and the Finnish manufacturer of military armoured vehicles, Patria. The state prosecutor, who filed the indictment motion, is the wife of the secret political police agent who arrested Mr. Janis Jansha in May 1988. At the time of the first incident, Mr. Janis Jansha was a political dissident who was conceiving opposition to the communist regime, while at the second incident, Mr. Janis Jansha was the leader of the opposition and a former Slovenian prime minister who not only successfully led the European Council in 2008, but also implemented a series of successful reforms, balanced the budget, lowered public deficit to 22% of the GDP and led Slovenia in the Eurozone and Schengen area. The arrest and trial against Mr. Jansha and co-defendants in 1988 triggered the first mass protests in Slovenia, which was still a part of Yugoslavia at the time. After two years, the communist authority, under the leadership of the president of the Central Committee of Slovenian Communist Party, Mr. Milan Kuchan, gave in under the pressure of the nation and agreed to the partially free elections. Two-thirds of the members of the National Assembly were elected on the basis of general right to vote, while the last third was elected by the state-owned companies that were only allowed to be operated by the Communist Party. The Communist Authority nominated all the members of the electoral commissions, while the Democratic Parties were only allowed to nominate mostly inexperienced observers. After six months of imprisonment, Mr. Janis Jansha got an early release. He participated at the first elections to the National Assembly in the April 1990 and received the highest number of votes. In the conditions of limited voting rights, the anti-communist forces won by a narrow margin. In May 1990, Mr. Janis Jansha became the Minister of Defence in the first democratically elected Slovenian government. While the democratic forces, united within the coalition called Slovenian Democratic Opposition, closely won the parliamentary elections. Mr. Milan Kuchan, who was the president of the Communist Party, became the first president of the Republic of Slovenia. The democratic government offered a referendum on the independence of Slovenia in December 1990. 90% of the voters decided for independent Slovenian state. The communists tried to hinder the independence. They especially opposed the creation of Slovenian armed forces. Nevertheless, six months later, on 25th of June 1991, Slovenia was declared an independent state. What followed was the aggression of the Yugoslav army, which was not successful, and Slovenia, after 10 days of fighting, regained 99% of its territory. A fragile truce and the EU intervention with the Brioni negotiation followed. Later, Serbian leader Milosevic decided to withdraw the army from Slovenia and to constitute the concept of the Great Serbia. In October 1991, the last foreign soldier left Slovenian territory, and in January 1992, the EU recognized Slovenia as an independent state. Two months after the diplomatic recognition of Slovenia, the communists fully returned to power. The democratic coalition Demos fell apart due to a mixture of internal conflicts and external pressure, and the communists, converted into multiple parties with new names, then formed various coalition governments up until 2004. Consequently, they have suspended all processes of transition. Judges and prosecutors, who the communists appointed before the elections, got a permanent mandate. In the meantime, a partial privatization of state assets was carried out, 
which resulted with the majority of business in the hands of the former directors and officials appointed by the Communist Party. First, they took control of the media. Some have already been privatized just before the first elections due to a law which was valid only for a few months and enabled state-owned property to be gratuitously transferred to a private company. Upon the audit of privatization, the supervisory institutions identified over 700 major crimes. But the judiciary, completely controlled by the communists, failed to complete a single criminal procedure. All cases have either been blocked by prosecution or outdated. The communists have occupied all the important functions not only in state institutions, but in society as a whole. Even chancellors of the university are usually appointed from among the members of the last central committee of the Communist Party. The former communist leaders, as well as their children and grandchildren, have become heads of state institutions, constitutional and supreme judges, presidents of the Court of Audit, governors of the Central Bank, ambassadors and representatives of Slovenia in international institutions. Former employees and collaborators of the communist secret police, who were retired by the first Slovenian government, found new jobs in courts, the police, the Bank of Slovenia, the Corruption Prevention Commission, the Court of Audit and the Office of the Information Commissioner. Former chairman of the Communist Party, Milan Kuchan, was, due to his almost complete control over money and media, easily elected president for a second and third time. He remained in that position until 2002. In 1997, he ran for the office for the third time, despite the fact that the constitution limits the function of the president to a maximum of two terms. The constitutional court, made up of judges nominated by him, remained silent. After formal retirement, Mr. Kuchan founded an organization called Forum 21. In it, he gathered a structure of people that used to sit in the Communist Party Central Committee at the time of a one-party authority. Influential directors, nowadays also partial owners of state-owned enterprises, banks, media editors, diplomats, a portion of cultural workers and old apparatchiks. Today, Forum 21 controls monopolies in state-owned companies and banks, the media, judiciary and a large portion of culture and sports. Despite the fact that it integrates the wealthiest individuals in the country, it usually stands for a so-called democratic socialism. Before each election, Forum 21 is to publicly determine which party in its domain is defined as the main favourite. Occasionally, just before the election, it sets up a new party that is then successfully promoted with an abundance of financial and media support. In the 2011 general elections, such a party was founded two months before the elections and named the Zoran Jankovic list, reaching 28% and a relative majority. The career path of Milan Kuchan and his successors at the head of the Communist Party, which retained all its assets from totalitarian times in the new system, best illustrates the failed transition in Slovenia. At the head of the Communist Party, which was first renamed the Democratic Renewal, then the United List of Social Democrats, and at the end, the Social Democrats. Milan Kuchan was succeeded by Cyril Ribicic, namely a son of the former president of the Yugoslav communist government, and the Minister of the Interior from the times after the Second World War, when the communists killed more than 100,000 people after the bloody seizure of power on the territory of Slovenia. More than 600 mass graves from that time had so far been found on the territory that covers 22,000 square kilometers. After leaving the presidency of the Communist Party and on the proposal by Milan Kuchan, Mr. Cyril Ribicic became one of the nine members of the Constitutional Court, the highest judicial authority in the country. The Constitutional Court has a lot of power. In some cases, it may even adopt decisions with a force of law instead of parliament. After the expiry of the term of office of constitutional judge, Mr. Ribicic was appointed a member of the Venice Commission in 2012 by the Socialist government. He is intensively engaged with imaginary violations of human rights in Hungary, where the Commission is continuing to pressure Viktor Orban's centre-right government. Mr. Ribicic's successor at the forefront of the party has become Mr. Janis Kocjancic, who was in office only for a short time and then became chairman of the board of the National Television, 
national radio and television broadcasting station, which is the most influential media in the country. His wife has become Chancellor of the University of Ljubljana, the largest educational institution in the country. At the same time, Mr. Kocjancic was named President of the Slovenian Olympic Committee, which is directing the sporting events in the country, including some investments. He still holds that position. The most influential circle in Slovenia includes the former communist secret police chiefs. For the crimes committed in and outside of the country, they have never been held guilty. For Mr. Janez Zimljeric, ex-boss of the Slovenian Communist Secret Police, it was found, at the opening of the archives, that he was directly responsible for the terrorist bomb attack in Austria and a number of massive human rights violations. However, Public Prosecutor's Office did not react, and Mr. Zimljeric is still seen as a key person for allocation of money regarding major investment in national infrastructure. Mr. Silvo Gorinz, former chief of the Yugoslav secret police called UDBA, similar to the Soviet KGB, is directly responsible for many killings of the Yugoslavian immigrants. In Western Europe, especially in Germany, his agents were cold-heartedly killing members of the anti-communist Yugoslav emigration. Despite the recent discovery of strong material evidence, Slovenian prosecutor's office does not react. Mr. Gorinz is currently an influential member of the leadership of the Social Democrats. The prosecution has difficulties to respond to such discoveries, as the Attorney General of Slovenia, Mr. Zvonko Fischer, was a judge who drastically violated human rights in the former communist regime. That is also why he was appointed to this position. At the end of the 80s, among other things, he sentenced two Catholic priests to prison just because they held a mass for a group of tortured innocent civilians that were killed during the communist revolution. Mr. Branko Maslisha has been the president of the Supreme Court of Slovenia for many years. Mr. Maslisha is the well-known judge who imposed the last death penalty back in the former Yugoslavia. As a judge, he worked for the secret political police and was the president of a special secret commission that approved and somewhat legalized killings of civilians who were shot in the back when trying to illegally cross the former border between Yugoslavia and Italy. Procedures at the border were the same as at the Berlin Wall, and were imposed in Slovenia for two more years after the collapse of the Berlin Wall in Germany. Mr. Zlatko Šitins represents an example of the neo-communist monopoly of the media in Slovenia. Communist Party of Slovenia 35 years ago ordered the publication of a special weekly newspaper called the Nedelski Dnevnik, in which propaganda content was skillfully included in the popular media content. This weekly newspaper, which was sponsored by the state, and was very low cost, soon reached the high circulation. Mr. Franz Schittins was nominated for the editor of the weekly newspaper and is the son of the then Secretary General of the Communist Party. Mr. Zlatko Schittins is to this date, in 2013, still the editor of Nedelski Dnevnik, which is one of the central media assets of Forum 21 and their black propaganda. In the meantime, of course, communists skillfully privatized this newspaper and many others. The newspaper has always received substantial subsidies from state enterprises. In the conditions of almost complete domination by the old monopolies in the society, the new democratic parties have since 1990 never managed to form a solid majority at the elections. Out of seven-party coalition of democratic demos that formed the first government, only two parties survived in physical and program terms. Communists skillfully dismantled all others, or infiltrated their own people inside the parties and then either destroyed or turned them into their manipulative tools. Leaders of these parties experienced a similar fate. Under constant media pressure and victimized from repressive authorities, one after the other, they withdrew from public life. Some became ill and died. Among them, the father of Slovenian statehood and the leader of a democratic coalition demos, Mr. Jože Pucnik. Just before the presidential elections in 1992, presidential candidate Mr. Ivan Kramberger, a serious challenger of Mr. Milan Kuchan, was shot in the middle of the election rally. His suspected killer was sentenced to only nine years in prison and was then early released. In the meantime, a new house was built for him. A few months after the death of the popular presidential candidate, Mr. Ivan Kramberger, the Slovenian tabloid newspaper, Slovenske Novice, led by a former associate of the secret police, established a special fund named Ivan Kramberger, 
which collected financial contributions for disadvantaged people. Honorary member and president of the fund became none other than Mr. Milan Kuchan. Of all the leaders of the Slovenian Spring, as Slovenes called their period of transition to a parliamentary democracy and independence, despite the fact that they were mostly young people, only two have remained in the political arena. The first Prime Minister of Slovenia, Mr. Lojze Petele, is currently a member of the European Parliament, and his party, New Slovenia, Christian People's Party, won 4% in the last general election in 2011. The former dissident, political prisoner and Minister of Defence in the first government of Slovenia, Mr. Janis Janša, is President of the Slovenian Democratic Party. In the last general election in 2011, that party received 26% of votes. The Slovenian Democratic Party surprisingly achieved a relative majority in the 2004 elections. The shock among the neo-communists, or the transitional left as they are called in Slovenia, allowed Mr. Janis Janša to build a coalition in which a small member was a leftist party called the Democratic Pensioners, DESUS, which then prevented some necessary reforms, in particular all measures of deconstructing monopolies created by the former authoritarian regime. In economic terms, the government was nevertheless successful, as Slovenia achieved almost 5% growth during the period from 2004 to 2008, managed to balance the budget and nearly eliminated unemployment. After his surprising election victory, Mr. Janša was named an internal enemy by the communists who have done everything since his arrest in 1988 to politically destroy him and connect any and all political affairs to him. In addition to daily attempts to personally discredit him in the media, anonymous and public threats to him and his family were made. In 2006, when he was a prime minister, he also received a death threat. The death threat was sent from a work computer by an armed agent of the police force, Mr. Zlatko Gumilšek. Mr. Gumilšek was dismissed from the police, criminal proceedings were initiated, but the case lapsed in court. The judge who oversaw the lapsing of the procedure meanwhile received a prize for diligent work, and the next socialist government employed Mr. Gumilšek again, also returning him his weapon. Exactly one month before the general election of September 2008, the newspaper Nedelski Dnevnik, as an unofficial newsletter for Forum 21, published an article that a big bang from Finland will sweep away Mr. Janis Janša and his party. One week later, the Finnish television, Ile, released a film entitled The Truth About Patria. Created in cooperation between the ILE journalist Magnus Berglund and individuals from the network of the Slovenian Forum 21. The film ends by showing a capital J and the claim that the journalist possesses evidence that the letter J represents the Slovenian Prime Minister Janis Janša in the correspondence between representatives of Patria who manufactured armoured vehicles and certain lobbyists. The letter J, as the film claims, was bribed to ensure business for Patria. Despite the journalist not putting forward evidence for this shocking claim, the Patria film was broadcast already the following day on Slovenian television and as such marking the election campaign and enabling the Social Democrats to beat Mr. Janša's party by less than 1% of the vote. For the next two years nothing had happened regarding the affair. Then, in August 2010, public prosecutor Ms. Branka zovic Hrastar submitted a prosecutorial motion to the lower court in Ljubljana against Mr. Janša claiming that, in 2005, at an undetermined date, at an undetermined place, and through an undetermined method of communication, he received an unknown promise of reward for his party, to ensure business between the Slovenian government and the Finnish manufacturers of armoured vehicles, Patria. There had been no progress with the case before September 2011, when early elections were called due to the catastrophic results and dissipation of the left coalition. According to public opinion polls, Mr. Janša's SDS was going to win by a considerable margin. Right before the start of the election campaign, lower court judge Ms. Barbara Kleinschek opted to proceed with the trial, even though she had previously claimed that due to the order of cases, this particular one would not continue for several years, putting the leader of the opposition on trial garnered a lot of media attention, which meant that for the second time the Patria affair was surrounding the Slovenian general elections. The trial dragged on for almost two years, with all 40 witnesses denying the allegations made against Mr. Janša.
The material evidence confirmed that lobbyists from Patria were in contact with certain officials in the Slovenian Ministry of Defence, but it also entirely dispelled the allegations made in the Ile film The Truth About Patria. In fact, the evidence showed that the letter J in the correspondence between Patria and the lobbyists did not belong to Mr. Janša, but a Croatian citizen, Jerković. On June 5th, 2013, despite all the evidence, Judge Ms. Barbara Kleinschek suddenly cancelled all previously scheduled hearings and pronounced her decision. She found Mr. Jansha guilty of receiving an unknown promise of reward for his party at an undetermined date, at an undetermined place, and through an undetermined method of communication, and sentenced him to two years' imprisonment. The judgment, which is not yet final, aroused a lot of outrage in the Slovenian public, with a large crowd having gathered before the court in protest during the declaration. Virtually all legal experts in Slovenia abhor the judgment that was published three months after its delivery, the statutory deadline being one month. Only a judge of the High Court, which will review the appeal, Mr. Kočević Bergant, publicly congratulated the lower court judge for her courage. President of the High Court of Ljubljana, Jerne Potočar, appointed as a judge during the time of communism, as the son of a former member of the Communist Party leadership and the chief of staff of the Yugoslav army, supported her. This kind of conduct of the appellate court that gives such suspicions of impartiality in advance would be difficult to hide from the international community even if it happened in Ukraine or Belarus. Mr. Jansha has filed an appeal against the sentence. It should be resolved within three months. However, Slovenian courts almost never respect the deadlines, and there is a danger that the Court of Appeal, led by Mr. Potocar, would endorse the absurd sentence of the Court of First Instance and turn it into a final sentence, or that it would postpone the decision until the beginning of the next election campaign. It is even possible that both things would happen, and with that departure affair directed by the Forum 21 would have a direct effect on already the third election in Slovenia. As observers from the outside, we wonder how is it possible for an opposition leader in a state that has been an EU member for nearly 10 years to be sentenced in such an absurd manner? He is supposed to have received an undetermined promise of a reward at an undetermined place, at an undetermined date, and in an undetermined way. How can one possibly bribe someone with such a promise? By using such a vague formulation in the wording of the indictment and the sentence, one can charge anyone and at any time. The judge only needs courage. The accused has no possibility to defend him against such vague allegations. He has no possibility to even start proving his innocence. When the communists sentenced Mr. Jansha for the first time 25 years ago, they referred to the fact that he held in his desk a series of documents on the basis of which he intended to write articles critical towards the communist regime. Many of his colleagues in Slovenia and elsewhere in communist countries were being condemned on the basis of false or planted evidence. In the Patria case, they didn't even find it necessary to falsify the evidence. They can always rely on the European certificate, being an EU member state and the independence of the judiciary and of the individual judges. They believe that under this disguise, they can condemn anyone, even without evidence. In the case of Mr. Jansha, they probably know that the judgment will be reversed sooner or later. If no sooner, it will be reversed at the European Court of Human Rights. But it may take years before the European Court decides on the case. Regardless of that, the planned political effects will be achieved, as they will be able to decide not only on how, but also when the judgment will be made, just as they did in the past without taking the facts into account. And even if the judgment is reversed, in the end, no judge will have to answer for that. In March 2013, violent protests organised by the Forum 21 and speculations of two smaller political parties brought down the second SDS government. After that, the Slovenian transitional political left finally dropped their mask. In April 2013, they gathered at a big event in the sports hall Stožice and loudly sang the old anthem of the communists, Internationale Bandiera Rossa. Rossa 
and a new hit song of the Slovenian transitional political left, Europe is a Gang of Thieves. At the event that was attended by President of the Republic, Prime Minister with a number of ministers, the President of the Constitutional Court and the President of the Forum 21, the flags were flown with the Communist Red Star, hammer and sickle, and the event was broadcasted by state television. There was not one national flag flown there, let alone European one. The EU development funds were used to restore the monument dedicated to the former Yugoslav communist dictator Tito. In schools, they have begun to dress children in pioneer uniforms and pushed into their hands the wooden rifles. At the events funded by the government and celebrating the totalitarian past, so dressed children stand together with communist paramilitary units which are dressed in the old Titoist uniforms and with weapons in their hands. Europe does not notice that, even though these kinds of events in the last months became mass phenomena and present no longer an individual excess. Parading of uniformed but unarmed extreme right-wing formations in Budapest encounters an immediate condemnation of the government of Hungary and the European press. Yet parading of uniformed extreme left-wing Titoist units with weapons in Slovenia are supported by government money. And Europe does not notice it, although Slovenian national television almost weekly plays a video recording from such events, where children are abused and songs like Europe is a gang of thieves are sang while the restoration of democratic socialism is requested. In 1996, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe adopted a special resolution on measures to dismantle the heritage of former communist totalitarian systems. Resolution in the third paragraph draws attention also to the consequences of unsuccessful transition and it says, the dangers of a failed transition process are manifold. At best, oligarchy will reign instead of democracy, corruption instead of rule of law, and organized crime instead of human rights. At worst, the result could be the velvet restoration of a totalitarian regime, if not a violent overthrow of the fledgling democracy. When this resolution was being drafted in 1995 and 1996, its drafters almost certainly did not pay much attention to Slovenia, which, until 2009, at least from the outside, was considered a success story in the group of post-communist countries. However, under this guise, a different true image was hiding. Socialist majority in the Slovenian parliament in 1997 voted against this resolution and flatly refused it. This was followed by some equally unsuccessful proposals by the opposition, until in 2009 the Slovenian parliament also rejected the European parliament's resolution on European conscience and totalitarianism because it also mentioned communism. This vote further testified that the transitional process in Slovenia, to a large extent, has not been successful, and that the old structures have been largely restored within the new institutions, while in some spheres, especially in judiciary, there were no serious changes at all. The final consequence is deep political and economic crisis in the country, with even worse prognosis made by European Commission and the IMF for 2014 and 2015, putting Slovenia at the last place among all 28 members of the European Union.